and welcome to this session of uh, AO North America's master class, uh, which is brought to you by the entire AO North America Hand Education Committee. Jay Bridgman is going to be our moderator for this evening, and Peter Ree is going to field the questions. But before we go on, um, I know that we uh, are conducting this not only on this platform, but also on Ortho TV, and the attendees on that platform come from a large parts of Asia. So I will take this opportunity to wish all of you a very happy Diwali. And uh, with that being said, I will pass this on to Jay. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's AO Trauma Hand Masterclass Series, Assessment and Management of the Unstable DREJ. Our master surgeon tonight is Dr. Thomas Fisher from the Indiana Hand to Shoulder Center. And we're really excited to have him tonight. And and Uh, I'm Jay Bridgman. I'll be the moderator tonight. I'm from the University of Missouri, and I'm pleased to have Peter Ree with me from the Mayo Clinic. who will be handling our question and answer session. And then we're uh, excited tonight to have, uh, from a therapy perspective, Jessica Fisher from the Indiana Hinge Shoulder Center, who will also be giving us uh, some uh, perspective from the therapy side. Just to uh, go over some uh, housekeeping things, these are our disclosures for our faculty tonight that we want to make you aware of. This is our agenda to tonight. We're gonna to try to wrap up uh, at about uh, 10 after the hour. Uh, we've given a majority of the time for Dr. Uh, Fisher's presentation, but as well as going over some of the rehab principles with Jessica. And uh, I've got some cases that we could go over if we have time, as well as uh, going through the audience uh, question and answers with Dr. Reed. This is a content validation statement. We'd like you to know more about AO North America, a little bit about what we do as an organization. And then uh, for Zoom etiquette, all of your microphones have been muted and your videos have been turned off, but we'd really like you to participate through the question and answer um, section on the Zoom uh, platform. The chat function has been disabled except for faculty, so please use the question and answer so that we can get some audience participation going. And then finally, uh, just a summary of our learner objectives. I won't go through these in detail, but these range from identifying radiographic indications for the surgical procedure to defining appropriate surgical anatomy recognizing pitfalls and, and how to strategies to avoid them and reviewing pertinent literature for our topic tonight. And with that, I'd like to pass the baton to Dr. Fisher. So thank you, Dr. Fisher, for being with us tonight. My name is Tom Fisher, and uh, thanks for the introduction, Jay and Chai. Uh, the North American Hand Education Committee is less than 10 years old, but has brought some incredible content during this time of the great pandemic. And I've been happy to uh, participate in this uh, ongoing um, uh, education program. Um, I'm really happy to uh, be here tonight. Um, and uh, I'm just trying to find my uh, correct presenter mode here. There we go. I take it, you can still see my slides is fine. Um, I, uh, my conflicts have been, uh, uh, adjudicated. Uh, I do uh, take some money from Cynthia's time to time for technical writing, but that's about it. So I'd like to thank Bill Kleiman, who has uh, kind of focused me on my uh, one postage stamp size area of the anatomy for the last 33 years, and has really helped me uh, understand this concept of this tiny little piece of real estate. But I'd also like to thank Andy Palmer and everyone who listens to this talk tonight, you should go back and review Andy Palmer's initial work in 1993 and subsequent uh, years, his work, uh, who really brought pathology of this uh, little area to light. And, uh, you know, we used to call it an ulnar-sided wrist brain before 1984, when we first started realizing that uh, there was pathology over here when we started sticking arthroscopes into the uh, wrist. And I'd like to thank Gary Paling, Terry Whipple, and Champ Baker, who were the guys that got me started on uh, wrist arthroscopy and gave me a great understanding. I'd also like to thank Jeff Greenberg, my partner, who uh, gave me a couple slides and a couple cases for this talk. We'd like to go through indications, techniques, pearls, pitfalls, complications, and outcomes. Uh, probably won't get much to outcomes, but we'll try. Uh, remember, this is a, a unifying concept, the forearm axis. And the TFCC is just one little component of it, but it, it makes up a, a forearm joint. And we're gonna talk just about the distal end of that joint 
the distal radiolar joint and how it affects uh, wrist pathology and forearm pathology. And like I said, it's a postage stamp size piece of uh, real estate that has uh, a lot of uh, small details to it. But in the blue are the important deep ligaments. Uh, and I really, I call these the foveal ligaments or the deep ligaments. They're called the ligamentum subcreatum and by some and others just to say that's just a vascular uh, anomaly that, uh, or a vascular vestige. Uh, and it's really not uh, what was described as the ligament of subcratum, but nonetheless, the deep fibers or the foveal fibers are the important guys. The green fibers are the superficial ones that attach to styloid who are always indicated by styloid fractures as their uh, avulsion. But uh, this in combination with the bony constraints of the um, curvature of the sigmoid notch, this is like the glenohumeral joint. Think of the distal radial ulnar joint like the glenohumeral joint with a shallow uh, a glenoid and a, and a more rounded uh, humeral head. And it does rotate and translate. It's a slide and glide joint. So it's inherently unstable. And we need to add some stability to it. And so uh, extrinsic stability, in addition to the uh, TFCC and its ligamentous stability, it's the ECU, the ECU sheath, the pronator quadratus, the interosseous ligament uh, or the distal oblique ligament, and the distal interosseous membrane uh, at the inferior part of the DREJ. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. It's a dual action joint. It has both a ulnocarpal component to it as well as a radiocarpal component to it. And that piece of that uh, radiocarpal is part of that forearm joint. Remember our uh, wrist loading is about uh, uh, 80 some percent uh, of um, on the uh, on the radius and about 16 percent on the ulna as you as you load the the wrist it shifts over towards the ulna just a little bit but remember this lunate fossa here and the proximal uh, or the distal radial ulnar joint the so-called sigmoid notch they are integrated to each other so injuries the uh, the scapho or lunate fossa and the distal radial ulnar joint are inexplicably or inextricably linked together. And then you surround it with all these ligaments down here and you get some form of stability. The best thing I can say tonight is I, I fixed the TFCC when the hinge is broken. And when the hinge is broken, that means that it's either got a minor instability or a major instability. And I think uh, some of the minor instabilities are about like tennis elbow. They hurt, but they don't uh, really cause gross instability. And we'll go through some of those. We're not gonna talk about central flap tears tonight. These are not really a source of instability. Uh, I guess you could call them a source of instability in, uh, in linear uh, loading in the fact that the, uh, the disc moves around in an abnormal fashion. But the 1A Palmer central tear uh, is uh, pretty easily treated with a scope and debridement and is one of those home run operations. Instability, let's define that a little bit. The loss of the capture of the sigmoid notch. And it can come from radial malunion or it can come in from alteration in the ligament tension from uh, uh, malunions or from displacement of fragments that the ligaments attach to on the radius. But uh, it's a loss of ligamentous support that can be purely soft tissue and also can be associated with the deep styloid fracture. And, and really the, the base of the styloid isn't the fovea. The base of the styloid has still got those superficial ligaments on it. The fovea is just a little bit displaced, a little further in, in road. And um, the uh, displacement though of these styloid fractures can suggest uh, foveal avulsion. And so stability is really given to us by the bony contours the gravity of the compression load, a muscle tension, the ECU, the pronator quadratus and others, the IOM, especially the distal components of the IOM and the TFC itself. For me, there's, there's two kinds of instability. One is a minor instability that's, uh, does, it hurts, but it really doesn't clunk out of place. Uh, and those in, include dorsal marginal tears of the TFCC, the so-called 1Bs. Uh, the subsheath tear is the ECU, where we detach the TFCC from the stabilizing influence of the ECU tendon and the fifth and sixth dorsal compartments. You really detach the, the, the tendon and its vertical structure 
off the the the, um, the rim of the TFCC. And then there's partial foveal tears where the deep ligaments are just partly injured. They're unstable enough to be painful all the time, but not unstable enough to allow the joint to clunk out of place with its natural slide and glide instability. The major instabilities are really the complete tear of the fovea where the, the, the distal ulna uh, subluxates off of the distal radius. In, in actuality, it's the distal radius subluxating off the distal ulna because remember the ulna is the stable member of the forearm. And then there's gross instability of the ECU with subluxation and uh, translocation, and uh, it can become completely detached from the TFCC and its sixth dorsal compartment. Symptoms include ulnar-sided wrist pain, which I think at last count, I had about 24 conditions that have been described that create ulnar-sided wrist pain. It's worth, worse with rotation and grip, especially ulnar deviation, rotation and grip, and pronation. And there's mechanical complaints like clicking, catching, locking. And you really got to correlate the findings you have with the physical exam with the history. And you can talk to them about gripping and twisting, you know, hammers, wrenches, screwdrivers, uh, and those kinds of things. The physical exam is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, it's, uh, you can use an eraser tip and, and uh, push gently on the, the fovea or so-called burger's point after Dick Burger described uh, Berger's point, also known as the foveal sign. And then there's instability where you can shuck the distal radial ulnar joint just out of its, uh, out of its realm on the radius. Um, I don't use a lot of advanced imaging, but I do when I need to prove a point or to exclude other problems such as, especially Keenbox disease. And then arthroscopic evaluation for me is, is helpful but you really can't get to the fovea very well arthroscopically. You can see it indirectly, feel it indirectly, but you really can't visualize it directly very well at the arthroscope unless it's just grossly unstable. Then you don't need a scope to make the diagnosis. Um, for me, the uh, Burger's point, it's just south of the ulnar styloid. It's uh, a place where between you and your examining finger and the, and the uh, TFCC, there's no other contravening structures like the ECU or the fifth dorsal compartment or the uh, ulnar artery or ulnar nerve. And so uh, that's also known as a foveal sign. It's a very specific exam. It's got very specific tenderness. It's not the tip of the styloid tenderness. It's really volar to that. Uh, it, uh, you can do stress loading and then uh, you can do shucking and mechanical signs of instability but always, com always, always compare it to the other side. Just get the other elbow up there in the table and, and give two comparisons. Even your thumbs are pretty heavy sometimes, so press them with both thumbs at the same time on the fovea on, uh, on Burger's point really can help you if the patient's a little jumpy and uh, every time you press on them, they, they react. For me, this is my uh, favorite. This is taught to me by Bill Kleiman. This is one of our fellow fellows, uh, Mary, she's uh, examining this wrist and you put it in, put the wrist in supination, elbow stable on the table, and you translate the ulna towards the patient with the palm facing towards the patient. And so when you play, when you displace that ulna palmarly on the radius, you're displacing the radius dorsally on the ulna, but palmarly on the radius, you're really testing the dorsal deep ligament the opposite ligament from the direction you're pushing. And then in pronation, with the hand po pointed toward you and you translate the ulna dorsally, you're really testing the volar deep ligament. And we'll go over that in a few minutes in, in the anatomy piece of this. But these two tests, where it can recreate, and many times they'll recreate in, in uh, supination, but they won't recreate pain in pronation. And then you can kind of tell which which side is, is, is a little more affected. But this is my favorite stress test for the distal radial ulnar joint besides ulnar grind, which, which really tests the axial portion of the TFCC. Ad advanced imaging, uh, MR and MR arthrogram, our, our local uh, uh, radiographers, our musculoskeletal radiographers are starting to go away from MR arthrogram and uh, they'd much prefer just having the joint fluid in there 
and uh, to give them the contrast they need with the three Tesla magnets. So the CT scan, uh, I rarely get CTs unless I want to have it with comparisons. Without comparison, I don't think CT helps me with axial alignment of the ulna and its relationship to the radius. But you really have to evaluate it in neutral pronation and in supination uh, and compare both sides and make sure you know, both wrists are locked in the gantry uh, correctly. And, that, and that's, a, that's a lot of control you have to have to get good CT comparison to the other side and to make a decision based on, on that type of displacement for me. The one thing that MR helps me with is ulnocarpal impaction and Keenbox disease. The bright white um, uh, uh, signal you see in the very ulnar corner of the lunate and in the triquetrum also, and uh, sometimes the TFCC defect. So MR is really helpful for me to exclude that and also to exclude um, Keenbox lunatomalacia. In addition to me, for me, this sign right here, and this is Jeff uh, Greenberg's case he gave me because it's the best illustration I know, where you see the, um, you see the, uh, let me get over here to my screen. You see the, um, the fluid go all the way to the styloid. There's nothing stopping it in the fovea. It goes all the way to the styloid. For me, that's a complete, foveal avulsion. And here's the interoperative picture that shows just a bare end of the ulna. He didn't have to do any real dissection. And this young lady had seen seven different docs, only one other hand surgeon. And, and she, refer, or, uh, she referred uh, this patient on. She's a college volleyball player, got seen by three or four sports medicine primary care docs, and uh, finally got to somebody who could do the exam. And and sure enough, uh, she had gross instability and the foveal evolved, and she got back to playing after uh, foveal repair. And so um, uh, Dick Berger first described uh, the displacement of, um, of the uh, ulna on the radius to, to diagnose foveal detachment. And it's a subtle change between the two. It's a difference between 16% displacement versus 5% displacement. And it depends on where you draw your lines. So uh, a little bit of this is uh, measuring it with a micrometer, marking it with a piece of chalk and cutting it with an ax is my favorite orthopedic axiom. We get down to these tiny little measurements and, and you really don't, uh, it doesn't benefit me as much. Uh, I look upon the fovea as a spot weld. And here's an illustration of a classic spot weld. And it's got uh, engineering, uh, uh, criteria that go with it, but in the center, it's really strong. It's very small, but it's very strong. And uh, that's really what the fovea is. And it's interior to the base of the, um, uh, of the uh, styloid. And uh, here's a good illustration by Gary Schnitz and Bill Kleiman that uh, shows the, the deep ligament uh, or the foveal ligaments as opposed to the superficial, more capsular ligaments uh, on the uh, uh, on the radial or the ulnar styloid. So here it is from above again, and and you can always tell where the where when you're looking at an axial view, you'll always look for a Lister's tubercle, always look for the big teardrop over here, uh, and always look for the notch on the end of the ulna where the ECU is. And so you'll be able to orient yourself quickly if you see that that uh, Lister's tubercle. The big tongue of uh, of the um, uh, lip of the um, uh, foot or the uh, teardrop of the uh, lunate fossa, which is very elongated and gives you that great buttress on the palmar side, is why many times these are quite stable in supination because you've got that good bony buttress down there. And so here's uh, here's that illustration where you look at the slide and glide characteristics. So. In extreme pronation, you only have about 10% surface area in contact, and it's uh, in contact with that more shallow dorsal rim. In, in supination, in it, the extremes of supination, you've got that great bony uh, block of the, of the um, teardrop of the lunate fossa. And in neutral, you, you really stack, the radius is stacked on top of the ulna, and that's the greatest bony constraint. So when your forearms are neutral, and you're lifting like a hammer curl, you're really stacking one bone on top of each other. And remember the, the lunate, or the, the lunate, 
the ulna lifts the radius and the ulna is the, the primary lifter of the forearm. The radius just floats around like a bucket handle uh, around that distal end of the ulna. So when you're in pronation, supination, you're relying on the ligaments to do your stability for you in lifting. But when you're in neutral, your, your ulna lifts your radius quite well with good bony contact. And so here's that deep, uh, uh, deep ligaments, the deep fibers. Uh, you see the cartilage, you see the more superficial fibers there, the TFCC on top and the distal radial ulnar joint and the seat of the ulna on the radius. And so with that in mind, remember, uh, here's pronation because the Lister's tubercles on top and your uh, ECU uh, uh, notch is on the dorsal side over there. And you remember that when you're in pronation, palm down, it, it's really your palmar fibers that are keeping that ulna from, from translating any more dorsal. The dorsal superficial capsule is taut and the deep ventral fibers are taut also. The deep, super, or deep fibers are lax on the dorsal side and the superficial fibers are lax on the palmar side. And it's just the opposite in supination. Here's supination with the Lister's tubercle pointing down. The uh, ulna is up against the, the uh, uh, teardrop of the lunate fossa. And uh, you see the, the deep portion of the uh, foveal uh, ligaments are, is taut on the side uh, opposite uh, where the head of the ulna is headed. So remember the deep uh, fibers are opposite the direction you're going. So here we are at the scene of the crime. Here's a complete ECU dissociation. So this is one of the extrinsic stabilizers of the TFCC. Besides the intrinsic stabilizers, which we just looked at, here's the start of the extrinsic stabilizers of the TFCC and the ECU and its stable stability. The other piece of that stability is the joint reactive force that occurs here when the ulna lifts the radius. And here's the entire forearm with the brachialis lifting the ulna and the ulna lifting the radius and the IOL keeping the radius from translating more proximally. So distally, you really have the TFCC that keeps that joint from sliding in and out. And then longitudinally, you got the IOL to keep it from shortening too much. So the load carried by the hand is, is directed uh, through the wrist onto the radius, then onto the ulna via the uh, sigmoid notch in the radius. And here's our force diagram with a very small lever arm distally, very long lever arm in the uh, radius on the, in the uh, forearm and very small amount of force on the proximal radial ulnar joint when you're lifting. So the greatest joint reactive force is there at the distal radial ulnar joint. And these intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments keep that ulna from sliding out. And that's what you, when you get the clunk. So the palmar soft tissue has been known for a long time. So here's the superficial stuff with the pronator quadratus. And um, it's a components of helping try to stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint. And Bob Hotchkiss was, uh, has been a long-term friend and he was my teacher when it came to that IOL and uh, how its uh, anatomy is, uh, is uh, fairly variable and also fairly complex. And the distal fourth has really been well-defined by the Japanese Moritomo uh, from Japan has uh, done a number of dissections. And, and he's really shown that the three distal ones, the distal oblique ligament and the uh, central band and the accessory band uh, are really the, the three isometric uh, components of your uh, forearm uh, interosseous ligament. And in combination, give you stability in both pronation and supination. And then the, uh, the uh, dorsal oblique accessory cord, the proximal two are somewhat off axis and really not isometric, but do give you linear uh, support. So the radius transmits the load of the ulna through the IOL and the distal oblique ligament also helps to stabilize the distal radial ulnar joint. Uh, I just don't know how much that DOB plays into minor and major stabilities because it is so variable in the human population. I have to give a shout out to, to Andy Palmer with this slide as he uh, gave us these uh, four basic uh, um, uh, lesions of the TFCC. 
I don't really use them much. I'm sorry, uh, Andy, but uh, I, I go for a foveal tear, a marginal tear, or a, a central tear. And those are my kind of three things. I, I'm an orthopedic surgeon. I don't uh, go for four things at a time. I go for three things at a time. So here's our techniques. And my, my four repairs for the TFCC, um, one of them is um, we're going to you know, the debridement we decide we aren't going to talk about, but uh, ulnophobial tears, partial and complete. And those, uh, I think, require a drill hole in the end of the ulna to get them to work well. Dorsal marginal tears, aka the ECU subsheath tears, retinacular tears, or red zone tears, the red zone being the vascularized zone on the dorsal or palmar side. And then there's the palmar ulnocarpal ligament tears, those that can turn into VC. And there's all these longitudinal split tears, which uh, uh, Lee Osterman has been a champion of describing. Uh, and uh, they're, for me, they're infrequent and stable, but a source of pain. But the uh, palmar ligament tears can be catastrophic at times and uh, need attention. We're not going to talk about them a lot. And then there's combinations of all three. But for me, the, the foveal tears and the dorsal marginal tears are the two biggies, and we'll talk about those the most. So for me, any open repair for me is a, or any uh, foveal repair is really an open repair. There's plenty of great arth arthroscopists out there that can get the hole in the right spot and can get things uh, anchored in the right place. But uh, for me, I, I like to drill a hole in the end of the ulna, put an anchor in and sew things down one piece at a time. And uh, whenever I drill the hole in the distal ulna, I chant release the stem cells because a hole in the distal ulna gives you every component you need for healing. It gives you vascularity, it gives you stem cells, it gives you a healing response, it gives you all the PRP you want. And uh, I think it's just the best way to stimulate uh, healing in a somewhat uh, minimally vascular environment. And so for me, the instabilities are a foveal repair. MRI helps me with signal change at the, at the uh, fovea of the, the central fovea of the ulna. Uh, radiographic subluxation criteria help me, but uh, arthroscopy with putting a probe on it and pulling on it uh, is uh, one of my gold standards for uh, whether or not the fovea is partially or completely torn. And uh, for me, the only time I use graph material is when I've had some other operation in the area, an open injury, such as a machinery injury that has removed soft tissue. But for the most part, I think for sport-related and, and low-velocity-related injuries that haven't been operated on in the past, you got plenty of tissue to make that spot weld happen again. And uh, I only use grafts uh, in pretty much secondary surgery or when there's been loss of substance. For me, the pre-styloid recess, anything uh, palmer to that or, or uh, central to it is uh, a more of a foveal injury. And anything peripheral to it, i.e. underneath the ECU subsheath, is really a dorsal marginal tear for me. And that's the so-called 1B tears. And so the foveal tears are more instability and the, and the dorsal marginal tears are more of a pain and, and not so much st instability. For me, foveal repairs, you really have to get rid of all the granulation tissue that's there. There's usually quite a bit uh, to breed that. I use a Palmer approach and go right through uh, uh, Burger's Point. Uh, I leave the ECU tendon on the dorsal side. I know my partners, they'll uh, go from the dorsal side, and that's a perfectly good approach too, but I just feel more comfortable going in from the Palmer side. Uh, I use a large drill uh, to put a hole in a bone anchor. You can use whatever bone anchor you want. But I, I usually have three separate sutures, and I use a MyTech anchor just because you can thread extra sutures on it that are uh, uh, different sutures. And I use a absorbable suture for the central portion of the TFCC, and then I use non-absorbable sutures for the dorsal limb and the palmar limb, and tie those all three to the same anchor. And so... Here's the anchor going in. Uh, here's the fovea uh, on the left. You see the, the uh, erosion at the fovea. You see a small avulsion fracture that ended up being a little bit bigger piece than we thought. 
and so uh, ends up with a little tension band and a pin to hold that dorsal capsule or that superficial capsule down. And then the second uh, uh, anchor and the, and the small anchor has got the tension band on it. And then the big anchor has got uh, the three sutures on it. And uh, you can, if, the nice thing about these MyTech anchors is you can throw a couple extra sutures on for insurance purposes. But for me, I like to use absorbable sutures in the TFCC and the intra-articular stuff. I don't like fiber wire in the joint. So um, the anchor characteristics is, uh, it doesn't have to be absorbable, but it should be static. Uh, it should have uh, some freedom to add some extra sutures to it. Uh, I like uh, I like suture anchors that let you run the sutures through the eyelet and pull tension on one side by pulling on the other. And um, I usually uh, do the subsheath tear uh, associated with the foveal tear uh, with one of those sutures on the anchor. Uh, and you can do combination injuries with uh, with uh, these three sutures. You can get the dorsal side, the palmar side, and the central TFCC. Um, I don't pin these uh, very often. Uh, they have to have gross instability. And if I'm going to feel like I need to pin them, I actually put a box frame on the forearm with an external fixer with two pins in the radius, two pins in the ulna. And that way I can adjust my uh, uh, relationship by between my radius and, and uh, ulna very accurately. Uh, dorsal marginal repairs are fun to do. Uh, they're like uh, lateral meniscus repairs in the knee. Uh, you can use a lot of different soft tissue techniques, a lot of different arthroscopic techniques, but everything basically comes down to the base, basic same thing. You got to avoid the dorsal sensory branch, especially the aberrant or the uh, variation of anatomy, the transverse branch. You uh, don't want to include the ECU tendon in your repair. If you catch it or, or snag it, you will have a chronic ECU tendonitis. Uh, and uh, your knots, can, if they're tied inside the ECU tendon sheath, can cause chronic tendonitis, especially if you're using a PDS suture that's long-term uh, absorbable or a, or a, a permanent suture. You got to let the e ECU go. You got to let it glide, and you can't be scooping it up with your repair. And uh, almost all these uh, repairs really reintegrate the vertical septum between the fifth and sixth dorsal compartment. Uh, to the TFCC, the so-called subsheath. And so uh, you see here, the, the vertical arrow is on the ECU. You see that big robust uh, sheath underneath it. You're looking at the inside of the joint here. And right where that black probe is, is kind of the vertical septum between five and six. But you're really trying to tie that back down to the dorsal rim of the TFCC. Think of the TFCC as, as the floor, uh, the disc is your floor. And that ECU tendon is a vertical column like you'd have in a building where you got to tie the floor to the, to the vertical column to make it, uh, make it stable. And so uh, there's a variety of ways you can uh, tie that ECU subsheath, uh, fifth and sixth dorsal compartment, back down to the rim or the green, the green zone there, also the red zone because it's vascularized. Uh, but somehow you got to get that ECU uh, back down to regulate the tension on the TFCC. And so uh, you really want to reintegrate the ECU uh, with the TFCC just distal to the uh, 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 tip of the uh, uh, ulna. And so two sutures, you can put one on the ulnar side, one on the radial side. A lot of times I'll just put two sutures on the radial side, depending on the, the uh, configuration of the tear. But um, you really want to get that capsule back to the floor of the ECU. You can do it arthroscopically. It's uh, fairly straightforward to do. Uh, and you go between the fifth and sixth compartment, use uh, these uh, instrument maker needles or TUI needles or any type of suture in and out passing needles. There's so many good techniques for passing that arthroscopically. But basically, you seal that edge back to the, to the rim of the TFCC you exclude the joint fluid that's bathing that area and you uh, tie it back down and then you mobilize the, the patient. And, and I think Jessica, uh, our, one of our hand therapists is gonna talk about that uh, just after I shut up and quit talking here. But uh, for me, uh, vertical problems, uh, namely 
uh, ulnar carpal impaction problems uh, is uh, uh, you really need a, a different kind of exam and you really need zero views and grip views uh, and then uh, advanced imaging to look at the lunate. And that's a whole different talk, I think, is ulnar shortening osteotomy, which is another one of my favorite operations of all times. But arthroscopy for me is a gold standard for the subsheath tears. Uh, it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. Uh, you know, it is technically demanding. There's a lot of great techniques out there and it has a learning curve. Uh, I thank Terry Whipple and Champ Baker for introducing me to the arthroscope in the 1984. And I, I really think since that time, we got better equipment, we got smaller equipment, we got HD cameras, we got great, great uh, jet pumps now that really regulate the flow. And uh, you can do dry scoping because we have such good HD cameras now. And uh, intraarticular manipulation and intraarticular repair are a commonplace now, or they were difficult at best in the early days. Yeah, I think you can do an exam under anesthesia with the scope in, and it can kind of help you decide how stable that, uh, that TFCC is. There's the thing called the trampoline effect, where you just lose all the, the uh, tension of the TFCC. Uh, the hook test where you stick a hook in and pull on it, see if you can displace it away from the, from the fovea. And then you look for synovitis and retraction. And for many years, we looked right past subsheath tears and didn't know what they were because they were covered by synovium. And we didn't have great lighting and we didn't have great lenses and didn't have great cameras. And then we all of a sudden we figured out, well, if you take a little bit of that synovitis away that you're looking at, you'll see the cleft right there underneath the ECU tendon sheath on the dorsal rim. And the, and the hook test also, you can stick the hook underneath the TFCC and raise it up so you know you have uh, some sort of detachment on the ulnar side. For me, uh, the, the arthroscopic repair confirms the diagnosis, localizes the tear, lets me get the tear debrided of all the synovitis that's really part of the uh, inhibition of healing. You can prepare the bed and scarify it a little bit. You stabilize the tear by various techniques, and then you turn it over to your hand therapist for great post-operative care. And I usually immobilize them for about four to six weeks, depending on the size of the tear. For me, uh, open versus arthroscopic, uh, it's not hard. You'll find, the, um, you'll find your, your groove as far as what you feel is a triumph of technology over reason with some uh, arthroscopic repairs. Uh, for me, instability, uh, I, I like it one time and I use anchors and a big, big drill hole. And I use the three limb repair to pull the TFCC and the volar and dorsal rims back to the end of the ulna at the phobia, not at the styloid. And then um, the other peripheral tears are really uh, done well by the scope. And these central tears, uh, I just show them for completeness. So, excuse me a minute, get away from this video. So uh, the repair zone uh, is really the rim and the debride zone is that central portion. So here's that uh, India ink uh, just showing you the vascularized zone and these are the ones that re repair and, and do pretty well. And uh, you can have them all the way out to the edge of the styloid, but they may include uh, tears with fractures. Here's India Inca injection, just showing the, the great vascularity of the rim and the A vascularity of the second. Uh, I use the Whipple technique that goes back to 97. Uh, you can use a lot of different uh, methods, but uh, the Tui needle or the, the uh, meniscal repair uh, uh, Techniques are quite good, quite reliable. Uh, single knot techniques, uh, cannulated needles and snares, all have been described. You got to find one and master it and feel good about it and uh, just get that cleft closed and get it stabilized back to the floor of the, East, uh, the ECU. Uh, ulnar repairs, uh, they're peripheral and stable. You, you really just have to re anchor the, the edge of the TFCC back to the ECU debride it and um, do your outside end portals, uh, six U incision sometimes, and uh, then insert the suture retriever 
pull it back through and pass a couple horizontal mattress or vertical mattress, depending on your pattern of your tear and then time on the outside and gradually mobilize them. So uh, 1C, the least common. So um, reparable TFCC tears, uh, I think um, for arthroscopic for me are the associated lesions for open repairs, it's in, uh, instability and, and where the uh, TFCC is just cleaved off the uh, two limbs of the, of the wrist. Um, Here is um, the end of the ulna, and uh, you can do it through a, uh, a drill hole uh, up through the fovea, or you can do it with a suture anchor. I personally like suture anchors better than drill holes. And then um, a lot of times the end of the ulna just is bare, and you really have to put the TFCC, which is that dorsal or the distal structure, back down uh, to the end of the ulna. And here you're looking into the, you're looking at the triquetrum with the disc and then the end of the ulna there. Bare ulnar head, foveal base, periphery of the TFCC. And then grab a hold of it and get it back down to bone. And here's the drill hole. Uh, that uh, you're putting your sutures in. Like I said, I use a, a third one, a PDS suture, to go through the limb of the TFCC. And here she is, college volleyball player, a um, number of weeks later, a number of months later. Ulnar impaction, uh, just uh, um, basically an unloading operation by shortening. And then outcomes, uh, there's been a, a lot of papers on a lot of different outcomes. I, I think the, the size of this uh, presentation night, you could talk all night about different outcomes of either foveal tears, peripheral tears, um, uh, palmar split tears, uh, central tears. There's uh, just a lot to, to go through. And that piece of real estate has uh, a number of different uh, pieces of pathology. So uh, when you talk about outcomes, I think you need to be more specific about the pathology. So I'll stop there and um, be happy to answer questions. And I'm going to hand it over to Jessica Fisher. No, no relation. She's too, too good looking to be mine. But um, uh, Jessica has been our, you know, one of our hand therapists here for uh, just a few years, but she's proved her dynamic. And she stepped up to the plate and, and volunteered to do this. And I'm Really proud to have her on tonight. Thanks a lot. Hi, I'm Jessica Fisher, and I'm an OT and certified hand therapist working at the Indiana Hand to Shoulder Center, and I'm presenting on the post-operative care of TFCC repairs. The specific protocol following a TFCC repair is determined by the structures being repaired and the stability of the joint, but today I'll be reviewing just a general protocol. Before evaluating the patient, therapists must obtain therapy orders and the operative note to determine a plan of treatment. The initial evaluation typically occurs 10 to 14 days after surgery. At this visit, the bulky dressing and sutures are removed and a light compressive stockinet is applied. Patients generally find this light compression very comforting and will continue to use it throughout their recovery. A long arm orthosis is custom fabricated with the forearm and wrist in neutral and the elbow at 90 degrees flexion. This is shown in the first photo. Neutral positioning allows the ligaments to be taut, but the forearm position may be changed depending on the structures repaired and as directed by the surgeon. A monster orthosis shown in the second photo is another option. This orthosis allows the patients to perform elbow motion while limiting forearm rotation. The patient wears one of these two orthoses at all times until exercises are initiated at four to six weeks. At this time, the patient is transitioned from the long arm orthosis to a wrist immobilization orthosis worn until 12 weeks post-op while progressively weaning to a wrist strap. 
Depending on the severity of the tear and the stability of the joint, short arc active range of motion exercises are begun four to six weeks after surgery. This slide illustrates the range of motion progression moving forward. Range of motion exercises are gradually introduced to identify potential sources of pain, as all exercises should be performed in a pain-free arc of motion. If pain presents, moist heat helps to improve overall flexibility while decreasing pain during exercise. Wrist active range of motion is performed with a fist to increase dynamic stability and with the form in neutral and rested on the table to prevent ulnar deviation. The form range of motion is performed with the elbow flexed during supination and elbow extended during pronation, as this allows for increased motion and reduced pain due to the increased space at the PRUJ. As you can see in the videos, patients are educated on rotation and translation of the radius over the fixed distal ulna. For pronation, the patient will place fingertips on the volar distal ulna and apply dorsal directed pressure, while the thumb or palm applies pressure to the distal radius to rotate the radius around the fixed ulna. For supination, this is done by placing the palm on the dorsal distal ulna and applying a volar force, while the fingertips apply pressure on distal radius to rotate the radius around the fixed distal ulna. At 12 weeks post-op, a strengthening regimen begins. Exercises are performed in supination to avoid axial load to the ulnar wrist. And a lace-up circumferential wrist brace is used with forearm strengthening to decrease potential pain. However, forearm strength should be discontinued if ulnar-sided pain persists, as this may be too much strain on the TFCC. Long-term, the patient needs to avoid repetitive ulnar deviation, compression, and distraction to the wrist, including chin-ups and push-ups. A wrist strap can be used for heavy labor jobs and activities that cause pain. Following the TFCC repair, it is critical to use the patient's pain as a guide, progressing only when pain allows. Performing exercises that elicit pain may cause increased inflammation or even damage the repair. Thank you. Thank there you. was a question um, about Galeazzi fractures and what do I do uh, after a Galeazzi fracture? Well, I assume that the Galeazzi has been anatomically repaired. And so uh, I think that just put him in supination is adequate. And if they're stable in supination, so I put him in supination under anesthesia, push the ulna out the palmar side of the, of the distal radius. And if that works and it's stable, then I just splint them in supination for a month. Uh, there's an old Swedish study uh, that was done probably in the late 1970s, early 1980s, that showed that uh, with Galeazzi fractures, supination positioning was good enough to, to get them to heal. You know, for many years, we did that uh, prior to even knowing that there was a lesion called the TFCC. So um, uh, I think it's still a, an acceptable form of treatment. All right, Peter, I didn't see any other questions. Are, are there any other questions that I missed? Uh, no, there's, uh, let's see, there's just a couple new that, that just came in. Um, question about um, your thoughts, Dr. Fisher, on the uh, tendon graft um, reconstruction described by Dr. Adams and Dr. Berger. I think you alluded to the fact that, that you don't do tendon graft reconstructions too often. Um, but maybe your thoughts on why? I think there's usually plenty of soft tissue there to repair. And I, and I think that spot weld uh, is an extremely um, good place to, uh, uh, to get most of your tissue back down. Uh, you don't need much. And uh, if I do use a repair, I, I do uh, the front to back through the radius and then pull two strands, either weave it through the dorsal limb of the uh, TFCC and the palmar limb of the TFCC, and then pull it through a drill hole in the bone uh, rather than going around the uh, bone. Uh, the other one I like a lot is uh, Amit Gupta. He's online here because I just saw him uh, say, if you excuse the ulnar stylar repair to bone becomes much easier. That's not, a, it's a, that's quite good. I went through an era of fixing the ulnar styloid a lot. I don't much anymore, but Amit has a brachioradialis wraparound that's kind of an extra articular 
stabilizing procedure. Uh, but uh, I just don't have a lot of need for it. But when I do need, have a need for it, it's a great operation if you do it anatomically. And anatomically is drill hole in the fovea, you know, drill hole through the radius and the, ul or, and the uh, uh, front to back and a good quality skinny tendon uh, graft because you don't need a lot. Great, thank you. And then there's another question about if you have any technical pearls on the dorsal um, outside to in repair for your TF marginal TFCC tears so that, that uh, you can minimize uh, ECU irritation and just to make sure you're not grabbing the ECU and um, the not, not being so uh, irritable to the patient. Yeah, if you if you have well, I've never found a way of making the knot not irritable to the patient. Uh, I do use PDS. Uh, I use a two O PDS, and the knot is fairly prominent. And I just tell the patients it's going to be there for about six months, and it'll be a law of diminishing returns over time. Um, I think finding that anatomy uh, and remembering that the obliquity of that septum between five and six it is such a big healthy piece of tissue that you can get back down to the dorsal rim of the TFCC. And uh, you really have to cheat towards the fifth dorsal compartment. You can release the fifth dorsal compartment and, and see where you are uh, and not repair it. It's almost like you can transpose the EPL and not have to worry about it. Uh, the fifth dorsal compartment, I find if you open it, yeah, you don't have much pathology from leaving it open and knowing where it is and putting your knots kind of cheating over to the fifth side. If you get though uh, the ECU and get into the sheath itself and tie the knots, you, you gotta avoid that at all costs, but there's an obliquity to it. You're almost going underneath the ECU with your uh, travel of your needles from outside to in. Great, thank you. Uh, another question was in reference to now, the question was ECU split tear, and, and that may be what the, um, what the uh, participant was asking, but I'm, I'm actually more curious because uh, Dick Berger trained me. What are your thoughts on the UT split tear? Um, uh, and if, it, um, if it's something that you repair in your algorithm for um, owner side of wrist pain, uh, which, which the UT split tear shouldn't cause any instability, but just curious your thoughts on that. Yeah, it, to me, it's like a tennis elbow. It's a chronic uh, kind of uh, insufficiency of the soft tissues. It's a linear split in the direction of the fibers of the uh, uh, UT ligament. And um, it uh, just, I'm not sure exactly why it hurts, but it does hurt. And if you, uh, I, I do it sometimes open and sometimes I do it arthroscopically. Uh, it's a rare event for me. I don't find it a lot. It may have seen me more than I see it, but uh, nonetheless, it's always a, a differential for me. And um, I uh, sometimes uh, find ulnar-sided wrist pain that is associated with, with uh, Guillain's canal compression, and I'll release Guillain's canal and, and debride that. But it's, uh, it's a finding both uh, arthroscopically as well as MR as well as physical exam. And, and their, their tenderness is just a little more distal to the fovea, to Berger's point. It's more distal and, uh, and uh, radial to me, for me than the, the classic uh, foveal tear or foveal uh, pair, uh, pain. And also maybe what the participant uh, had originally asked was the ECU tears um, in, in the setting of, uh, let's say mild DREJ instability, um, the importance of uh, preserving the stability of the ECU within the six extensor compartment. And, and if you have to do associated debridements, tenus and evectomy for chronic ECU tenus and evitis in that situation, any, any thoughts on does your ECU management change because you want it to serve as your secondary dynamic stabilizer? No, I still, uh, I still repair the, I, I use a, use a Z type uh, uh, opening and, and just uh, repair the retinaculum over the top, but I, I'm more and in, more inclined to make sure that the floor is attached correctly. And because uh, for me, the, 
chronic ECU tendonitis is a subsheath tear till proven otherwise. I mean, when you talk about chronicity and uh, chronic and recurrent for me is usually a subsheath tear. Uh, however, there are uh, cases of ECU debridement and uh, in, in, in of itself, but uh, that was more so with chronic inflammatory diseases. I just don't see as much of it anymore as a, as a singular pathology. Got it. And then for, you know, a lot of the soft tissue ligamentous injuries that we treat, let's say, for example, from UCL injuries, we always talk about the in integrity of the ligament um, as a decision decision factor on if you're going to repair or not. Do you think that there is uh, a point where it's too far out from the injury that even if you can get the foveal attachment back to good, a good bone bed, that it's just too far gone that maybe the potential for um, the uh, foveal attach or foveal portion of the TFCC to repair down? Do you think there's a time that you would say, well, even if I do it well, technically it may not heal? Well, I've, I've repaired uh, chronic dislocation of the distal radial ulnar joint at six months, and I still found plenty of tissue to, to, uh, to repair down to the fovea, just as long as you debride it well. You have to empty out. There's always uh, tissue that's, that kind of contravenes into that recess that's created by the separation of the dorsal capsule away from the ulna, uh, or the palmar capsule away from the ulna, depends on which way it went. But I think you really got to clean out that secondary crud that fills up the joint uh, because, you know, the body just doesn't tolerate an empty spot very well. Uh, it, uh, it really likes uh, having, um, uh, you know, a, a, a filled up space. And so I think, yeah, clean out that filled up space, get back to a good capsule and then bring everything down and around. And, and, uh, but no, I don't see, I don't think there's a time frame for the intrinsic ligaments of the wrist. Yes, there's a time frame. You know, SL, LT, um, those kind. But extrinsic ligaments, I think they're still pretty well that you can find them, unless it's you know been out for a couple of years or something. And uh, I think the last question that we have so far is is still in line with chronicity. Um, let's say you have a distal radius fracture that you've restored, reconstructed anatomically, um, like a Galeazzi type, uh, which is this example. Um, but you repaired everything, you, you supinated them, um, you think they're stable, but lo and behold, you know, three, six months out, they're unstable. They're anatomically reconstructed. Is there anything that you do differently in this situation to try to give stability um, or still just try to reinforce the um, robust soft tissue around the owner side? Well, that would be one where I you know, might consider, depending on the age group, depending on the demands of the patient, I'm, I might consider the brachial, uh, brachial radial sling that Amit uh, described. I, I like that operation for minor instabilities, but major instabilities, uh, you, know, you might end up pinning them or put a X fix on after you've grafted them. I think that's a, that's a case for maybe a graft uh, uh, Peter, if it's been a long time and you had a failed primary repair. Now, if you just supinated them and it didn't heal back down, then I think you just can do a primary open repair. Great. And then uh, uh, Dr. Hanel, uh, uh, I'm sure you can probably see, he said a wonderful, a wonderful session. His question was, um, when it works, uh, just the um, hair, um, that being all that you're doing, giving stability to the DRUJ, why, why does it work sometimes and not others? Is there something that we're missing or? Uh, I just, I think that's, for me, that's a little too vague. I got to know a little bit more about the circumstances, Peter. Uh, I think you really need to analyze what you got. And, um, you know, and I look for secondary problems. I mean, if I've got a good repair and I, you know, I look for secondary problems like their ulnar nerve is getting compressed or they've got a chronic uh, uh, piezotriquetral arthritis or, you know, some or their LT ligament got pulled, excuse me, their radial lunotriquetral ligament got pulled off the dorsal side of their uh, triquetrum and it's not completely healed back down. I mean, there's lots of other small pieces of pathology, uh, ulnar styloid nonunions uh, that don't look so bad, but they can be painful. 
I mean, you got to look for all these secondary things. There's, like I said, there's one time I counted them all up. I could count 24 different pathologies on the ulnar side of the wrist. They've been described. Uh, I made it believe in about 20 of them. I don't know, but uh, uh, that I think you really got to start looking for other things because you got to trust your your operation unless you really kind of screwed up the post-op rehabbing, which is so important. And and uh, I think um, painful, uh, stiff, painful DRUJs sometimes are just painful because they're stiff. And I think that uh, little uh, running loop of um, a video that uh, Jessica showed uh, really is one of my favorite uh, exercises for the patients to learn where they take the heel of their hand, put, take their fingertips, pull up on the ulna and translate the radius palmarly with the heel of their hand. It's a very nice maneuver because it is a slide and glide joint. You got to get that joint mobilization, that translation going. I was just thinking how many of the 148 participants was doing that at the same time you were, you were uh, illustrating that. Um, I think probably the biggest take home point that I have from, from this uh, talk thus far is what you just mentioned here is that there's so many factors that go into the perception or true instability on the honor side. So uh, thank you for reiterating that. Let's see, Jay, do we have time for one last question here? Sure. Okay, um, and, and you touched on this, Dr. Fisher, but uh, I think just to be clear, what your indications are for the open foveal repair, it sounds like you prefer the open repair because you, in your hands, you can do that um, really, really well, but do all require open repair? Are there any that you would just treat arthroscopically for a foveal repair? And uh, not for a full-fledged instability. Uh, there's some minor ones that I've, uh, I just put a, a push lock in or something that uh, you can do arthroscopically. There's some great described arthroscopic techniques. The, the biggest problem I have is getting the trajectory and getting the anchor right down in the fovea and, and making sure my, my uh, trajectory is good and that it's, um, uh, you know, in the right spot on the, on the end of the ulna. Great. I think that's critical. Having it not, you know, having it off axis repair, is just not uh, conducive to good healing. I think that's Thank you key. very much. Pete, can I ask a question? Hey, Tom. Chuck, you're scaring me with that picture there. Just keep your head. That was, no, I, I only, it's an homage to you because I've learned so much about the, the TFC from you. Um, I just want to know why you settled on an anchor and, and, because you're a smart guy. And so you have to push the TFC down as you tie it, as opposed to pulling it down if you have a bone tunnel. And the, and the suture, at least one of those three sutures is gonna be in the joint, the way you describe it. So yeah. how, did you, how did you decide ultimately to use an anchor rather than bone tunnel? Um, well, I, I think bone tunnels are a fiddle for me. I, I, I per, personally like uh, anchors. Um, I think that if you drill a big enough hole, uh, you, you don't have to push it down all that much. But the first repair is that, is that central TFCC with an OPDS that's uh, put through the shackle. And you put your suture in and then you pull down the other, the other uh, suture and the lock suture gets pulled into the hole. And then you tie it down with a two hand throw technique. Um, and I think you gotta do the same for the other two. Um, when you tie down the first suture, the other two don't slide quite as easy, but they still slide, especially if you use a coated, uh, you know, kind of super suture that uh, is so good these days. We've got a lot, you know, that monofilament PDS glides very well and you use an OPDS or a two O uh, or a number two PDS and it uh, pretty darn strong for tying. Dr. Fisher, why don't we finish with two cases? We're coming up on the end of our time. Do you mind if Let's we go for two cases? Okay, let me see. All right, so uh, one case that's fairly straightforward and then another case that I thought was more difficult. This is a 31-year-old female um, that came to our hospital level one trauma center. She had an open distal radius fracture. Uh, she's a multi-trauma patient, so multiple extremities were involved. And um, the distal radius, uh, I believe was a type one open, but it was washed out and fixed on call by my partner. I got called the next day uh, and uh, let's just pull this up. 
this is kind of what they had done, open reduction and tonal fixation, but they had difficulty with the ulna being unstable. And so he said, I really couldn't keep it stabilized in the DRUJ, it definitely was subluxating. So I cross pinned it and we're, you know, consulting you to see if you could go back at another time and do a TFCC repair. Um, what I, uh, what I did was I got, knowing that I couldn't get her on the next day, it was gonna be several days before I could get her on the schedule. I got a CT scan just to get more information. And this is kind of a representative shot that I was gonna show was that the, the epiphysis isn't really fully reduced. You know, like the, the, there's still translation uh, there at the sigmoid notch. What, what are your thoughts about that, Dr. Fisher? Well, I think that translation, there's a trauma paper from about, uh, three or four years ago that said that you don't need to have that translation corrected but i i really think that that translation needs to be corrected as it's just like the offset of the glenoid you're really not going to tension the the uh the stabilizers around the shoulder unless you've got the glenoid fracture you know back at the neck restored and the length away from the scapula so that offset to me is real important to get that distal oblique ligament and your TFCC at the proper tension. So I'd put a radial, I'd take that pin out, put a radial column plate on here, uh, leave your distal plate or your polymer plate intact, but take all the screws out and shift it over, uh, just angulate it two, three millimeters and screw it back down or take the whole thing off and use a longer plate if you need to. But for the most part, I, I use a radial column plate, screw it down and translate it. The other thing you can do is, uh, use a, a lamina spreader in between the radius and the ulna and just yeah, spread yeah. it uh, side to side with uh, a small non-clawed uh, lamina spreader so you don't destroy the interosseous membrane there, but just distal to the IOL insertion on the ulna and spread it apart and that usually gets my offset back. Very good. So, I mean, I had a similar thought was that I wanted to get the epiphysis reduced and then check the stability again my plan was to do an open TFCC repair if it was remained unstable. But what I found, uh, these are just representative fluoro shots of the step off at the beginning. This is similar to the lamina spreader idea, but just using a reverse retractor to, instead of translating the epiphysis ulnarly, you're translating the shaft radially uh, to get your that that uh, ulnar cortex lined up. And uh, then I um, I didn't use a radial column plate, but I just revised the, the fixation um, to get capture and to support the fixation. And I found that it was very stable. The DREJ was stable in all three positions. I didn't need to open up the, uh, the, the, the uh, to do an open repair. I, I think Jay, that just shows how little you have to adjust that tension to, to make it make it more stable. I'm not a big fan of cross pinning. I try to teach or uh, uh, discuss with my partners. Like if you cross pin something, just send it to me sooner rather than later. Like if it's cross pin and it's six or eight weeks later, as you said, if it's not completely reduced, the scars in a bad position or the, the sigmoid notch is filled with scar already, that makes it very difficult to go back and revise it later. Yeah, and I might immobilize this in supination for a while too. Yeah. So this is a, uh, uh, just to finish the evening, a 16 year old female. This is one of mine. She came in, she had a interarticular distal radius fracture. Um, this one I was concerned about just because it was comminuted in the segment, uh, you know, the epiphysis was so narrow that I really felt like I needed smaller uh, devices like uh, fragment specific fixation to get control of the fragments for the epiphysis is so narrow. And I was fairly pleased with the result in the OR. Uh, you know, I had a radium column plate, I had a dorsal, um, ulnar plate. I had a volar um, uh, plate supporting the volar ulnar corner. And I, the, my assessment at the time, I thought that it was very stable. I was really pleased with the, the DREJ, which I tested, knowing that she had a, a ulnar styloid fracture. I tested that and I thought it was very stable. I thought the fluoro uh, showed that it was very stable. But in the post-op course, I started to see this within the first four weeks was that her ulna started, we started to see gapping at the DREJ, which she didn't have in the OR. And with a elevated lateral, we're starting to see the ulna start to subluxate uh, dorsally. And then this was related to her therapy as well. Like she had a block to supination. She had pain, which uh, you know, was not usual for you know, what we would see in the time period that where she was, that we thought that her, her range of motion should be improving, pain should be improving. 
So I, I uh, eventually evaluated this with the CT scan assessment of both risks in neutral, supination and pronation. And she was definitely dorsally subluxated much more. These are both in supination. And so you can see how much uh, dorsal uh, translation of the ulna related to the, um, to the uh, radius. And that she doesn't have much bony constraint. Like her, her natural anatomy is almost just like a, a, a sheer you know, face there. Um, so I recommended to go back and to evaluate the DREJ, but knowing the, the timing was that she may be scarred in. I may not get it reduced with just a, no, a dorsal approach that you may have to go bowlerly to release scar tissue on the bowler side. And so my plan at the time was uh, definitely a dorsal approach to look at the uh, DREJ and the uh, TFCC. Um, but if, the, if I couldn't reduce it, that I'd have to go to a bowler approach to release the bowler scar. Uh, Gar Mark Garcia Elias talks about this as well, of, of releasing the scar tissue on the bowler side. And that is what she needed. I, in fact, this is a starting fluoro here in the upper left. And then after I reduced, uh, released the scar, I could even with digital pressure, I could reduce the ulna back down into the DRUJ, but it wouldn't stay there. So then I, so through the dorsal approach, what I found was the dorsal uh, DRUJ ligaments had been avulsed off the radius. And so I, re I removed my, uh, my plates as a, on those sides as a part of the uh, treatment plan. And then I placed two acres uh, to repair the dorsal distal radial ulnar ligaments. Do you find that you have to uh, work on both sides of the DREJ in chronic settings like this? Yeah, I, I think you have to be prepared to go dorsal and palmar. I, I always approach them from the sub -Q border and go palmar first. Okay. But uh, put a freer up over the top and, and see how it is. I've already scoped the wrist usually to uh, see what that dorsal owner corner and buller owner corner is like. Uh, that helps me uh, to know what the stability of those two uh, insertions are on the radius. And then uh, uh, this is one where, you know, it's been out for a while. I might think about putting a, a four pin external fixator box on to, to hold it exactly right. Uh, and I'd, I'd probably repair that styloid too. Okay. That's, those are great points. So uh, we're going to finish tonight. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, through our sessions, the next session is November the 18th, uh, flexor tendon repair in zone two, which is uh, joining us is going to be uh, Dr. Jimbo Tanks. We're really excited about that. We hope that everyone can join us on November the 18th. And then um, just as a reminder that a link to the recording for tonight's session will be sent out to you um, 24 hours after the conclusion of this webinar for all of those who have registered. And then lastly, uh, we've been rebroadcasting the sessions, especially session one was rebroadcast uh, on a, as a podcast. And um, uh, these are uh, online uh, applications that you can use to access that podcast. We, are, we have that through our own website, uh, AO, uh, aonorthamerica.org, uh, on the Apple platform, Spotify, Amazon, and Google. So we're trying to uh, increase uh, access uh, through different platforms. But anyways, Dr. Fisher and Jessica Fisher, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And uh, we're really pleased that uh, uh, you could spend time with us. And uh, thank you for everyone for joining us. And we're going to sign off. Thanks, Jay. Thank Thanks, you. everybody.